This reading is Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 35. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favoured one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying, and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favour with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Thanks, Annette. Now, young people, did you know that there has actually been a war happening in our world, not just recently, but from the very, almost to the very start of time? Did you know that? You did? Oh, good. Then maybe you can tell me who that war is between. Do you know? Who's that war between that's been happening from the beginning of time, pretty much? Yeah? Between God and Satan. Excellent. Yes. That's very good. Right from the beginning, remember what happened in the garden? Who was it who picked the fruit? Who shouldn't have picked the fruit? Come on. Who picked the fruit in the garden? Yes. Eve, yes, Adam and Eve, they, they rebelled against God and they picked the fruit in the garden, didn't they? And who was it who tricked them? Who tricked them? Yes, the serpent, that's right. And from that moment on, God said that there would be constant warfare between Eve and all her children and the devil and everybody who follows him, the serpent and all who follow him. You see, Adam and Eve had done wrong, hadn't they? But they actually returned to God afterwards and they trusted God again. But some people wouldn't do that. They would carry on instead listening to the serpent's lies instead of coming to God for forgiveness and living under his good rule. So from that moment on, after Eve had picked the fruit, it was kind of like the world was divided into two different camps. Some who loved and followed God, and some who were deceived by the devil and followed him, whether they knew about it or not. And throughout history, the devil has constantly been at war, fighting against God's people, because, well, the devil hates God. And we actually see that when we open up our Bibles and, and look at history and read the story. You might remember the story of um, the Egyptians. God's people and the Egyptians, and how the Egyptians tried to kill the Israelites, didn't they? That was actually the devil rearing his ugly head again and trying to harm God's people. Or perhaps you remember the story of Goliath and the Philistines fighting against God's people. Do you remember that story? Well, that's just another example of when the devil was kind of rearing his ugly head again and trying to harm God's people. And in Mary's day, Mary, who we just read about in the Bible, things were not going well for God's people at all. They may have gotten out from under the thumb of one superpower and got back into the land where they were meant to be, only to find that there was another superpower there who um, had them under their thumb again. And what was even worse, was that the devil had actually seemed to have led quite a lot of God's people astray. And we're told that things were so bad, so bad for Israel, that actually de demons were running amok all through the promised land. That's why when we read later in the story that Jesus constantly was, was um, 
um, casting out demons because they were everywhere. Things were so bad for God's people. And it seemed like the enemy, the serpent, had the upper hand. And God's people, as a result, were suffering. They were really, really struggling. But God saw. And God was going to do something about it. Now, if you were God, what would you do? What would you use to try and defeat the enemy of your people? What things might you try and use? Any ideas? What weapons would you use to defeat the greatest enemy ever? Yeah. No, that's true. But what kind of what kind of weapons might we be tempted to use? Maybe a fighter jet or a nuclear missile, something that looks really obviously powerful, mightn't we? Well, surprisingly, God chooses not to use something that looks really strong and powerful or mighty at all to defeat his enemy. He actually uses something that looks really quite weak and ordinary. Isn't that a bit strange? It's not what we would do, but God loves using weak things to defeat his enemies because it shows to everybody just how powerful he really is. If he can defeat the greatest enemy with something that looks really quite insubstantial, then that shows everyone just how mighty and powerful he is. Just like he did back when um, his people were leaving Egypt. Remember, the Egyptians had them backed up against the, the Red Sea, but God defeats them. He, God uses a group of runaway slaves to defeat the greatest army on earth. Or remember Goliath? How was Goliath defeated? Who defeated Goliath? Anyone remember? You're all very quiet this morning. I'm getting it signed to me. Yes, David. I think that's David. Is that right? My sign language isn't great. Yes, David, a shepherd boy with just some slings and stones defeats the Philistines' greatest enemy, greatest warrior in, in mighty armor. And the Christmas story, well, it's no different. In fact, it's like all the other stories leading up to it in the Bible, but only better. God will use this time a little teeny baby born to a fearful peasant woman to put an end to the war that's been happening in the world. In fact, I wonder if you can actually spot her this morning. Can anyone spot Mary? We've actually had um, have Mary in our midst this morning. Can any of the young people spot her? Jonathan, you know, let other people do it. <laughs> you might need to stand up and have a look. Can you see her? Yeah, people are pointing here at the front. This is courtesy of Fiona and Jonathan. Jonathan and Fiona have painted this for us at this morning. I thought I was going to knock it over. So we have Mary with us. Um, and what, who, who did Mary meet? Who, did Mary, who came to meet Mary? We actually have two of them this morning. I've just spotted another one. Where's the angel? Oh, right in the back. And can anyone see another angel, actually? I can see one over here. Okay. I wasn't expecting this angel to be here, but uh, yeah. But yeah, Mary was met by the angel Gabriel. Now, how do you think Mary must have felt when the angel appeared out of nowhere before her? How do you think she felt? Any ideas? Surprise, I think, yes, more than surprised. How would you respond if an angel appeared before us just now? I would be really, really scared. Because although Emily doesn't look very scary, the angels in the Bible are mighty warriors. And they were really terrifying. So Mary was afraid, and rightly so. Um, but this just goes to show, you know, Mary wasn't some kind of superwoman, was she? She was just an ordinary young lady who trusted in God perhaps around the same age as Annette, who read to us earlier. She wasn't 
a superwoman. Well, what is it that the angel says to Mary? Well, let me read those verses from verse 33, 30 again. The angel said to Mary, Do not be afraid, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. That is some mighty big things to say about this baby, is it not? Mary, this lowly woman, would give birth to someone truly great, she's told. The son of God. God himself was going to come to earth to defeat his people's enemy. And he was coming through Mary. He would come and be king and defend his people and finally bring them this victory that they've been waiting for for so long. But not only that, but then he would then expand his kingdom over the face of the earth, bringing more and more people under his good and loving rule. And one day, and this day is coming, his kingdom will finally fill the whole earth and it will last forever. That's what the angel said to Mary. And that was all going to come about through this teeny tiny baby boy. And at this point, it was just going to be an embryo, small as you can imagine. All this was going to come through that. The wonder of Christmas is that the mighty and powerful God, the one who is going to conquer our enemies, the one who will build a kingdom that has no end, but was born in a stable to, as a tiny baby to a peasant woman. That's how our powerful God chose to defeat his enemy. God just loves displaying his power by using frail and weak looking things. That's what he's like. So young people... Don't be surprised if some people in your school don't see Jesus in the same way that you do. They might think, well, I think Jesus looks quite ordinary. He looks quite weak. He was just a baby and then a carpenter or a teacher. They might not understand why we make such a big fuss of a baby being born into our world 2,000 years ago because well, I guess on the surface, he does just look like any other baby, doesn't he? But the reason why we make so much of the baby in Bethlehem is because he is none other than God himself come to earth to be our king, to crush our ancient enemy. That's why we make so much of him. The baby in the manger might look weak and helpless, but one day he will destroy the devil forever, vanquish death, and reign as king over the world forever. That's the story of Christmas. Isn't that amazing? There's a lot of power packed into that tiny little baby, isn't there? Let's take a break for a moment. Our next reading is Luke chapter 2, verses 8 to 21. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Saviour, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a babe, baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on the earth peace among those whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, 
let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. And at the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Amen. I've only been here a year. I haven't been under uh, Sunday school or anything, but I, I felt that too. So thank you, Margaret. Um, but back to, back to the Bible, as much as I had to concentrate after that. Um, well, so far we've seen, haven't we, that God is powerful. He uses a peasant girl and comes to our world miraculously as a baby boy who will grow up to defeat our gracious enemy. But this obviously shows us what the boy said in their video too, that God really does care for his people. And we see that in the passage that Margaret just read to us. God is keen, isn't he, for the people in his land to know this great news that through this angelic encounter. This time there's an angelic encounter not with Mary, but with shepherds watching their flock on the hillside. And the shepherds encountered not just one angel, so it's a good job we have two here today, but not just two angels, but hundreds of angels at night. And when they met with these heavenly messengers, well, they had the same reaction as Mary. They were filled with great fear. They were absolutely petrified at the sight that they saw before their eyes. But that fear was soon turned to sheer joy when they heard what the angels had to say to them. The angels say, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. The angels say that they have great news for the shepherds, news that will bring great joy to all of God's people. They have news that will put a spring into the step of all God's people who feel crushed and hard done by. Those who are weary in this war that has been going on for so long. What's the news? A saviour is coming. A saviour. In fact, the angels say that this saviour is actually born that very night in the town of Bethlehem, just down the road from the, where the uh, shepherds were. The saviour has arrived. One who can finally rescue them. One who can bring them this victory they've been looking for all this time. He's finally here. The king that had been promised years ago has finally come to put all things to right again. He's arrived. And where will they find him? Well, they'll find him wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger just down the road. Can you imagine the shepherd's excitement at that point after hearing this news and finding out this king that's been promised is just down the road from where they are. But it wasn't just the shepherds who were excited, was it? The angels get overexcited as well and they start singing, saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is well pleased. They praise God for what he has done, that he has finally acted just like he promised he would. But God was going to finally bring peace to his people just like he had promised. Now, we don't get the details here in the Christmas story of how that is going to happen. But we know from reading the rest of the Bible how Jesus would bring this peace to his people. But the reason why things were going so badly for God's people at that time was because of their sin. That had been our problem all along. Ever since the serpent tricked Eve in the garden, every one of her children, including us, has been tainted by sin. If you like, it was a family trait, something that we all have in common. I wonder, has anyone ever said to you, 
to you that you look like somebody in your family. We often say in our household, there's a definitely a small look. When you look at the small family, they all look somewhat similar, don't they? Or a Maguire look. There's some features they share in common. Well, for us, the feature we share in common is that we all have sin. Just like Eve, we have that family resemblance. It's not a good resemblance. It's not like the smalls and the guires and their dashing good looks, but we have sin. And uh, that's why each and every one of us, we naturally want to rebel against God, don't we? Just like Eve did. And we sense that, don't we? We sense we have this battle within us. We do things we know that we ought not to do. Sometimes, after my kids have done something wrong, I sit them down and, and I say, why did you do that? And I think they've been genuinely honest to me sometimes. They might not be, but I think genuinely sometimes they say to me, you know, I just don't know why I did it. I have no idea. It just kind of overcame. I knew I shouldn't do it, but it just came upon me and there was nothing I could really do to stop it. We often find ourselves doing things we don't want to do, that we know are wrong. We often find ourselves saying, shove off, God. I'm in charge now. I'm going to do things my way, even though we know that's a really foolish thing to say and a foolish thing to do. But because we are like that, for years and years, the devil has pointed his finger at us accusingly and said to God, God, you are unjust for not punishing these people. They sin against you all the time. They rebel against you all the time, and you do nothing about it. How can you keep sweeping their sin under the carpet? These people deserve death. They deserve worse. And yet you do nothing. And thus, God's people were never really fully at peace with God. Our sin was always ever present, and something needs to be done finally and fully for it. And that's why... Jesus' is coming is so, so important. For later, the baby in the manger will become a man. And he will die taking our sin on his shoulders, taking the punishment for our sin that our sin deserves. And thus the devil can no longer point his finger at us and say, you are deserving of, of death and worse. Because our sin's already been punished at the cross. The devil's best weapon against us, his, God's people, has been crushed already. He's been disarmed when Jesus went to the cross. And now, well, the only right reaction for us is to join in that angel song, isn't it? Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Our sin no longer puts us under God's judgment. But rather, through this king who is born a baby... We now have peace with God, and he is genuinely pleased with us. Genuinely pleased with us. Not just um, sweeping our sin under the carpet. He loves us. He really does. So it's no surprise that the shepherds respond in the way that they do, is it? What do they do when they hear this great news? They go with haste to find that boy lying in the manger. And they tell all God's people, everyone they meet, the great news that the angels had told them and what they had seen with their very own eyes. God really does care for his people. He has made a way for us to be with him and taken away the accusations that the devil throws at us. So if you've ever wondered, well, does God really care? Does he really care about me like he says he does? because this is happening in my life, or this is going on at school, or I'm just having a really hard time, or perhaps we'll feel this even more in the next few weeks, I just feel really exhausted with life, especially when all these restrictions come in. I'm just done in, I'm fed up of it. Can God really care, does God really care for us? Does he really love us? Well, in those moments, remember that God has come and he has dealt with our biggest problem. He has disarmed the greatest weapon against us, our sin, so that we can be with him forever, free of shame. 
the greatest need has already been met. God really does care. And that is great. We'll be reading from Matthew 2, verse 1 to 12. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, the wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw a star, and when it rose, have come to worship him. When Herod her, the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and the scribes of his people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means, a, are by no means at least among the rulers of Judah. For upon you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And where you have, when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose, went before them until it came to rest over a place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going to the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned in the dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Thanks, Alistair. Well, so far we've seen that God is powerful. Though a baby looks weak, that baby would defeat our greatest enemy. And this is obviously great news for God's people as well. He cares. He really does care. He hasn't forgotten about us, but it's come to save us. But it's not just good news for God's people, is it? It's actually good news for the whole world. And that comes out in our last reading that Alistair just read from us. Isn't it interesting that wise men from the east come to Israel seeking the king of the Jews? You think that if Jesus is the king of the Jews, then he's not really any of the wise men's business. For they weren't Jews. They were magi from a distant land, maybe from the land of Persia or somewhere else. What interest do they have in the king of the Jews? Well, the prophet Isaiah prophesied long ago that this king's coming wouldn't be just good news for Israel, but for the Gentiles too, for all the other nations of the world. Listen to what Isaiah writes. It is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and his Holy One, the one deeply despised, abhorred by the nation, the servants of rulers, kings shall see and arise, princes and they shall prostrate themselves because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel who has chosen you. You see, God's plan stretched further than just rescuing Israel and his people. He would rescue people from the very ends of the earth. This child was to be a light to the nations, not just Israel. And foreign kings would come and pay homage to him. That's what Isaiah prophesied like these men from the east do here. God wants the nations to come to his king. And he does the extravagant to make that happen. He sets off a new star in the sky that these ancient astrologers rightly perceive to mean that a great king has been born. So they come, they follow this star all the way to the land of Israel. They travel a huge distance to get there. And when they arrive in Israel, well, where do they go? Where would they find a king? 
way would, do you think a king would naturally be born? Maybe in a palace? Yeah. You'd expect him to be born in a palace. So they arrive at Herod's palace. After all, that's where you'd imagine the mighty king of Israel to be born, no? Well, no. They don't find the king there. All they find is a very troubled King Herod instead, who asks then, where is this king to be born? And he pretends that he wants to worship the boy as well. But secretly, he's plotting to snuff him out, snuff out the rescuer before he comes of age and can rescue his people. For Herod is yet another appearing of the devil, isn't he? Of that ancient enemy. Though Herod's men tell him, that Jesus will be born and he's going to shepherd God's people. He's going to save God's people from all their enemies. Well, Herod doesn't want this to happen. But he was one of God's enemies. So although God would come in power to save not only his own people, but the world, which is amazing news that many of us here love, it will actually be sad news for some people. Some people will want to reject this news. The offer of salvation, having your sin dealt with, living under a good king, that is offered freely to the world. But it will result in one of two reactions. Some will respond like the wise men. They'll hear something of this distant king and will be willing to travel miles and miles over harsh terrain to find him. And when they do find him, they'll kneel down beside him and offer him the most precious gift that they can. They'll worship him and love him, give all that they can to him. But some will respond like Herod. They will reject the king so that they can carry on just as they were before, pretending that they are the great king in the world, though they're really just deceived by the devil, a puppet on a string. And that actually still happens today, doesn't it? Some will have their hearts won by this king, uh, this king who's come to save them. They'll be drawn to the light. But others, well, they'll be threatened by this great king and want to hide from the light. That's why when you tell your friends about Jesus at school, they don't always respond like you hope that they will. You think you've told them the greatest news that could ever be told, and it is. But they see it as perhaps maybe even the worst news ever, because they still want to be kings of their life. And Jesus threatens that. That's why some people could even get angry when you tell them about Jesus, when you ask them to come along to church or to Grace Kids, or maybe even to the Hope Explored course in the new year. They instantly put up their defenses because they don't want to engage with the idea that they're not actually in charge of their life and that there's actually a great king out there who they must kneel before and answer to. But here's the thing. We don't actually know whether people respond to Jesus like Herod or like the wise men. All we're called to do is to declare that news to everyone, just like the shepherds did. Um, throughout Israel, but not just to Israel now, but to the whole world. That's our, our job. So church family, Jesus being born shows us that God loves the whole world, even wise men from distant lands, and even those of us who are not so wise from even more distant lands are called to come and to worship him. But Jesus being born into the world will also sadly trouble some people, just like it did Herod. And I think this leaves us with two very important questions this morning. Firstly, we have to ask ourselves, have we responded like Mary and the shepherds and the wise men did to this great news that Jesus came into our world 2,000 years ago? Have you recognized that Jesus is the king promised of all, who has come finally to bring peace between you and God and put an end to all evil forever. Have you noticed that? And if you have, well, have you bowed the knee to him? And are you continuing to bow the knee to him? And secondly, I think if God has made an effort 
to inform the whole world about Jesus' coming. Shouldn't we? It's very easy, isn't it, to be a private Christian, to keep this good news to yourself. But if God loves the whole world, then surely we must love the whole world too. We must take a lead from the shepherds who told everyone they knew about Jesus and that he'd been born to be their saviour. And you know, it might be that we've not done a very good job of that. It might be that we've kind of missed our opportunities over this Christmas period. It might be that we're quite shy in school and, and keep our mouths shut to our friends. But like we've said, Jesus has come and those things are forgiven. We have a fresh start. We don't need to feel shame because all that's been dealt with. And we're given a fresh start, a new chance. And what better opportunity do we have than over the next couple of weeks to invite people along? Why not invite people along even this afternoon to the carol service, a last minute invite? Who knows how they re might react? Yes, they might shove that invitation back in your face like Herod, but they might respond like the wise men. They might say, oh, this is the one I've been looking for all this time and bow their knee to him and give him their hearts, their greatest gift. Amen. Well, let us pray. Father God, we thank you so much for the Lord Jesus. We thank you that in captivating that small, frail child was the very power of God come to save us. We thank you that you're a God who cares, that you're not distant, that you're not just far off and aloof from this world, doing nothing about it whilst it turns to chaos. But you have acted mightily and that you have come and saved your people. And we pray, Father, we make this known to the world around us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we sing our next hymn now, next carol, retelling the story.